in bloodlines and even that these psychopathic power players have some type of reptilian origin that might make them only half human. And as we know, it's very hard to find the smoking gun for these sorts of claims, and we're left with the analysis of small breadcrumbs, strange symbolism, and the occasional promotion of ideas and motifs that seem completely foreign to anything we would recognize in the mainstream. Well, folks, it seems like a 15th century relic known as the Solabushka Tarachi has broken free of its carefully maintained chain of custody behind the curtain as an aristocrat class magical heirloom to find itself on display in a Milan museum in modern times, and wouldn't you know, it contains aspects of nearly all of those oh so strange conspiratorial claims. Lucky for us, though, the royal worldview is carefully kept close to the chest, and putting such a relic in its proper context seems like a monumental task. Today's guest, Peter Mark Adams, is a brilliant esoteric scholar, tarot expert, professional energy worker, and occult symbol decoder that seriously dedicated himself to unpacking this deeply esoteric artifact fully drenched in the Demiurge, and has released his analysis and conclusions in an epic and beautiful book titled The Game of Saturn. It's one of the most impressive pieces of work that I've seen in some time. The implications are damn near unbelievable, and I can't wait to get down to it. A serious honor and a pleasure, a master of his craft, Peter Mark Adams, welcome to the higher side. Hi there, Greg. Lovely to talk to you. Yeah, man. I'm so happy to have you here. Scarlet Imprint always seems to work with amazing authors, and I'm really impressed with this book. Something oh, that, sure. yeah, I mean, it is something that I don't think I could put together if my life depended on it, you know, <laughs> so really kudos to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and. You know, to kick this off, we really have to break this down for people, but we're talking about an elaborately illustrated and decorated deck of cards that matches the structure of a classic tarot deck dating back to the Italian Renaissance. I guess it's the oldest known deck of its type in existence, but you call it a tarocci because outside of that same basic structure, it doesn't really have much else in common with traditional tarot. Is that right? That's right. There's about three cards in the deck that have a kind of passing similarity to the cards you'd expect to see amongst the trumps in a modern deck. But apart from that, everything else is utterly unique. Hmm. And it was that fact, actually, which really got me turned on to the task of trying to figure out why they've gone to such extraordinary cost, hmm. investment of time, the use of a Renaissance master engraver, <laughs> and yet the thing didn't make any sense. So there some, had to be something going on here, which I, I couldn't figure out. And that really led me on down the rabbit hole, to be honest. I, I started to disappear from day-to-day -day living as I got engrossed in this thing, you know? Yeah. And eventually I was working like 16 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. It took me about three years to break into the decks, heavily coded multi-layered symbolism mm -hmm. that's so provocative and the artwork on the cards they depict everything from fairly innocent looking figures to decapitation and holding babies over fire pits yeah but i guess what about the artwork is so special not only from a content perspective but a historical one as well yeah i mean this is the first it's the earliest complete tarot deck that exists that's one thing secondly it's been done by this Renaissance master engraver. So the, the quality is absolutely superb. And those two factors alone set the deck apart from pretty well everything else. The third factor, though, it has no Christian imagery or symbolism in it whatsoever. Mm. And that is, that is really exceptional. I mean, I can't think of another tarot deck in existence that doesn't include certain aspects of the Christian theology. Right. I found that strange as well because I'm a little bit familiar with the tarot and there's always that final judgment card at least, which yep. is a very Christian thing. That's it. And there's nothing like that in this deck. And again, that was another of the factors that drove me to try and figure out what the heck is going on with this thing. Hmm. There's another factor as well, Greg, which is really strange. This deck despite being a masterpiece of Renaissance art, has no provenance whatsoever. Hmm. And like provenance is everything in the art game. <laughs> Where did it come from? <laughs> Where did it originate? Who is, whose hands has it been in? Because this is a deck of cards that survived intact for 500 years. Mm. And nobody knows where it's been for at least 300 of those years. <laughs> <laughs> 
So there's a lot of mysteries. There's a lot of locked boxes. And it's like the wet dream for the esoteric researcher, you know. Absolutely. I, <laughs> I, I can't claim to have cracked the whole thing. I, I, I think I got most of the Trump and court cards decoded. But there's a substantial number of suit cards that still require work. There's more to come. <laughs> Always. <laughs> and so, you know, the main purpose of a typical tarot is divination. But is there an indication that that is not the same purpose here? Or is this just a different form of divination? I think people have always used different things around them for divinatory purposes, you know, whether it's coffee grounds or, or what <laughs> the original decks were created for gaming that's where the the tarot came from but of course because of the imagery because of its symbolic nature it lends itself to other uses specifically to divination i think that if i'm going to like jump to the core of the thing uh, what we're faced with here is something like an elite grimoire of surgical draconian magic hmm. okay if i just like sum up the end point of my research and the question therefore is where did it come from how was it used and what was the intent of the designer mm -hmm. in putting this thing together because it illuminates an aspect of the modern conspiracy world this this notion of a cult of saturn yes it illuminates the origins of this thing, which before now has been very nebulous. Right. And it is such a amazing piece of history, an amazing artifact for that reason. And I guess I would also ask you, because you're not the first person to look at this deck, what can you tell us about some of the theories about the deck and why it was created before you came along, the things that you dismiss? Well, the obvious thing is that, you know, nine of the Trump cards depict figures connected with Roman Republican history. So it's easy to dismiss the whole deck as an educational deck. But as an explanation, it just doesn't stand up. Hmm. How about the other, you know, trump cards? How about all the court cards and the, you know, suit cards? So, you know, the obvious explanation is too facile. Too suggests that it's an educational deck also doesn't take account of the homoerotic elements in its imagery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a Christian stance. And the fact that the trump cards that appear to name Roman figures have been spelt in such a way that you cannot immediately identify any particular person. OK, the Romans had a thing called the Gens. It was like a family name. And because the Roman elite was governed by a very small number of families for a period of like 500 years, the Gens doesn't give you any indication of, of which member of the family within that 500 years, you know, who it could be. Mm -hmm. So, again, it, it doesn't actually fulfill an educational purpose on that score either. The other explanation is that it's another wedding present, a kind of sumptuous wedding present like the Visconti Sforza deck. But again, the homoerotic imagery, the baby getting cooked over the fire, uh, scenes of immolation and decapitation. <laughs> that would be some wedding present, right? right. I, you know, as Gordon said, you wouldn't be invited back. You know? <laughs> True. So they're the main lines that have been attempted to explain the imagery in this deck, and, and they don't really work. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a deeper game going on. And another foundational thing that we should probably discuss with people or discuss for people is that there's also something that should be said about the historical context, like not only the politics of the time, but the attitudes about magical ritual and practice. This kind of speaks to those homoerotic elements you mentioned. But what do you think is important for people to know in that regard to place this back in its proper context of when it was actually made? OK, I mean, if we're going to turn the clock back to 15th century Renaissance Europe and specifically to Italy, magic in one form or other was pervasive at every level of society, from the kind of folk healing 
folk witchcraft and Carlo Ginsberg has done excellent work in documenting some of the long lived pagan witchcraft movements in Italy, the Bernadetti in the north of Italy. We have the possession cult of Tarantismo in the south of Italy. And on top of this, you have a layer of what I would call grimoire magic, so that you find clerical scholars, students, monks, priests, specializing in ritual magic for hire. Okay, mm. so if you have any problems, you go to them and, and they, you know, that you need a demon exercising or you want to summon a demon and send it against someone, the use of attack sorcery. These would be the go to people for that. And uh, we have excellent testimony from the inquisitorial records for Modena and Bologna, which demonstrate that these priests, the ones who were recognized as wielding a lot of power, in terms of demonic magic, we're very carefully protected by the elite. Mm -hmm. Their major sponsors were the elite families, in fact. And, and whenever an inquisitor attempted to take one to court, have them defrocked or whatever they could do against them, the elite families always stepped in and put the case aside. So they, they were well protected at the highest levels of the Renaissance society. Right. So the, that's pretty well the pyramid, as it were, the background into which this deck, which actually illustrates another strand and stream of magic coming from the East, entered into and merged with. Mm -hmm. Yes, that background makes it all the more provocative. And when it comes to the deck's influences and the worldview and ideas that it seems to contain, you kind of break it down into three parts because it can get pretty complex, but you talk about the deck's cosmology, its metaphysics, and its ritual use. And I think that's a pretty clear way to talk about such a dense item. What would you say about its cosmology, for example? It's wholly malefic. And, and <laughs> it identifies a series of planets, fixed stars, and constellations that are the most malefic in terms of astral magic. Mm. And it was this fact that gave me the first indication that what I was dealing with was a grimoire of elite sorcery of the darkest kind. Right. <laughs> okay, so that's the cosmology that we have here. Mm -hmm. The items, you know, you would find them in Picatrix or any of those classic texts of astral magic, but the ones particularly picked out and illustrated within the deck are wholly malefic. <laughs> so I, I, I can't conceive of another use of those energies other than what they call maleficium, attack sorcery. Right. It's pretty cut and dry when it comes to the things they were trying to invoke. It's just negativity across the board, it seems. It's, it's an exercise in power. I think when we look at these elite families, you know, we need to realize that they were not like a modern state. They didn't function in that way. Mm -hmm. They were far closer to the Godfather, you know, the, the film, the mafia. Hmm. They had their beneficial side, but they were capable of any kind of cruelty or evil. Mm -hmm. These were the families from which Machiavelli drew the principles of governing just by observing them. So on the one side, they would have dynastic marriages, they would have you know, agreements, treaties, and so on. But on the other side, the flip side of the coin is their employment of poisonous you know, sorcerers, assassins, spies. <laughs> so you know, there's like two sides to the coin. And, and this deck illustrates, and this is why it's such a rare artifact, a very dark side of the dark side of the coin. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to qualify that, and it's something probably we'll unpack as we go along, Greg, is, is to say that what this deck is exemplifying is not the traditional grimoire sorcery. Okay. Okay. Like the sorcerers, these guys, this elite employed, had copies of like the Key of Solomon and Almadel and, and those kind of texts, classic grimoires, you know. Mm -hmm. This stuff is of an order above that in terms of its educational background, its tradition. 
and it's almost never been talked about in the context of the Western esoteric history before, <laughs> because it's come straight from the Byzantine elite. Wow. Okay, it's another thread. It's not been thought about as far as I can see, and it's not been identified as a major player amongst the elites of Europe before. This deck is depicting a tradition which goes from Orphism through the Neoplatonists into the Byzantine imperial elite and from them to Italy. Mm. Man, it is, you know, no small thing. Yeah, dealing with an order of learned sorcery far above the popular grimoires. Mm -hmm. And so to talk a little bit about kind of how they view reality structure, you talk about how their view, the view that's expressed in this deck is that souls are reincarnated and kind of the symbol of the X is where they see the Milky Way crossing with the path of the Zodiac and that's the portal between the worlds. This is a type of worldview or cosmology that definitely wasn't taught to the masses, it seems. Yeah, this emerges directly from Orphism. So we're back in the 8th century BC, at least. Mm. And it's been picked up through figures like Pherakides, Pythagoras' teacher, Plato, of course, and the Neoplatonic philosophers after. So there's a continuous tradition there until uh, like the 6th century CE, so it's like 1,200 years old tradition at this point. Right. Okay, and then there's an attempt by the Christian emperor, you know, Justinian, to, to stamp this out. Not very successful because the Byzantine elite and especially its civil service were thoroughly imbued with the values of Hellenism. To enter the civil service, you had to have a relevant number of years study of Hellenistic classical literature and philosophy. And with that, it's kind of, you know, in the kernel of it is paganism. You can't extract it out of it. If you're studying Plato, you have paganism built in, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it perpetuated itself well into the 15th century. And you have major figures in the Byzantine court at this time, the imperial elite, who are self-declared pagans. You know, and again, this doesn't quite fit in with our church written history of the times, but nevertheless, that's that's how things fell out. Right. And you talk about a Mithric cult, which is something that I've had researchers dig up before, and they some suggest it's a thread that still continues in the background today. But to have these nods to a Mithraic cult at this time depth, it is strange. I mean, just, just what you're saying, this cult and these ideas should have been long gone by the 15th century. Yeah, they were well alive. I mean, they had a huge revival in the 10th and 11th century with people like Michael Pacellus, who recovered much of the literature. But again, our history lets us down, Greg, because, you know, we see people, figures like Michael Pacellus, who recovered the Chaldean oracles, as standing alone. We don't see them in context. Michael Pacellus had teachers who inaugurated his interest in these ancient texts and ideas, and, and they had teachers. And, you know, the golden thread runs back and forth, back into the past and forward into contemporary history. It's never broken. And I think there's one good reason why that's the case. The worldview that exists at the core of this system makes sense in a way in which doctrinaire theology does not make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, It is an esoteric, experiential approach to reality. So that for those of us who, for instance, work with energy, you do regression work, constellation work, whatever, the notion of reincarnation is a very real one. Mm -hmm. You experience people who recover past life information. So, you know, you don't need a theological judgment about it. It becomes part of your experience. And the belief system coming out of Orphism is rooted in real experience in this way. It's liberating because it has this many lives aspect to it. And it places the onus on your own moral development rather than obeying somebody's rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a dynamic element 
at the core of the belief system that perpetuates itself from year to year, from century to century. And even if it was lost, it would be recovered or recoverable. Right. Because that's the way things are, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. And, you know, these ideas you're talking about now, very Gnostic. And in regards to the deck as a Gnostic piece, you say, in categorizing the deck's cosmology as Gnostic, we need to take care not to confuse this fact with the historically documented Gnostic preoccupation with spiritual liberation. Nothing could be further from the worldview of the nobles who designed this deck. Yeah. And obviously that's an important separation. I guess, what other aspects of Gnosticism do actually make it into the deck? Everything is there, <laughs> except <laughs> this, this view that you should somehow clamber out of the cycle of metapsychosis and, you know, ascend to a higher plane. That is totally absent. This deck takes Gnosticism and converts it into a mechanism, or let's, let's put it this way. This deck as a Gnostic artifact embodies the idea that if the machinery of the universe runs in such a way that subsequent lives arise out of the way you worship, the way you treat deities in this life, then you can start affecting the trajectory of your subsequent reincarnation. Okay? Right. So this idea is, is taken directly out of Plato's Phaedrus, you know, wherein the deities you worship in this life, you enter their train, in, you enter their entourage upon death, and you travel with them, and then you kind of re-enter, okay? Now, the key here is to re-enter into a social circle that is suitable for your objectives. And for these elite families, the objective is to re-enter an elite family. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this way, the ritual suggested within the deck is a way of controlling the trajectory of one's own metapsychosis. And this is where the notion of bloodlines takes on a new and deeper meaning. Absolutely. That's so interesting because it's like we always see the elite as into playing the long game and these multi-generational mindsets. And Mainstream culture looks at that and says, well, that makes no sense. You know, people yeah. only live to be 70, 80 years old. They're not worried about what's going on for a 200 year game plan. But this context makes that seem plausible. And it justifies why that worldview would exist among the elite. Yeah. And if you look at the ethnographic record around the world, you find, you know, plenty of places where this is the way things are, are managed. They take a lot of care with death ritual to try and ensure the subsequent rebirth of that, let's call it soul, <laughs> back into the family group or into the community or whatever. And it kind of reaches a high point with the Buddhist lamas who, of course, attempt multiple subsequent rebirths into equally spiritual positions and monasteries. Mm. Okay? They have a mechanism for running that process and for them validating that it's working. So it's actually the Western esoteric system that's kind of lacking this. But clearly at an elite level, the awareness of it was still there. It is amazing. This is like exhibit A for the case that I've hear, heard people trying to make for such a long time without having any real evidence or proof. I mean, this is no small thing. Yeah. And I guess we should address dead on. Why is it called the game of Saturn? The figure of Saturn pervades this deck at every level. I've got a quote here. It's by Proclus in, in his Platonic theology. He says, all Greek theology is the offspring of Orphic mystical doctrine. And if you look at the Orphic theogony, it starts out with Kronos, the great serpent, gives birth to an egg. And from the egg, it splits apart to create the land and the sky, and, and within it is the figure of Phanes, wound around by a large serpent. So this is a very early component that situates Kronos at the most fundamental point of creation. Hmm. Okay, And Kronos is Saturn. Right. And for the Carthaginians, he was Baal Hamon. And in the Bible, he appears as Moloch. Mm. Okay, these are all the same entity, but different aspects of it. So 
with this roots in the Orphic tradition, Kronos becomes the central player. He is the demiurge. He is the creator entity. So the serpentine or draconian form of the deity is the primal one. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why the game of Saturn and then multiple cards within the deck kind of replay this, this theme of the serpent as Saturn, as the serpent, as Baal Hamon. You know, so whoever put this thing together had a very good grasp of mythology and the theogony and cosmology of various faiths. That is so true. And along this line, to quote you again, you say, the Dex theology embraces Gnostic cosmology in its totality, but nevertheless discards liberation in favor of the positive embrace of the Demiurge's worldly rulership. Is this to say that there's a mindset within the 15th century elite that says, hey, Demiurge, I know you're the boss. We figured this out. So how can I get on your good side? How can we work out a deal? I, Is that could, kind of the... I, I couldn't put it better myself, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's it. You got it. Wow. It seems so in line with conspiratorial suggestions today that the elite have made a deal with the Demiurge to basically be the management class on the earthly plane, to opt out of the rebirth cycle and stay in these positions, maintain these bloodlines, and in exchange have vast amounts of material wealth and power. I guess that's a worldview that's pretty aligned with this 15th century elite heirloom and its uh, chain of custody, I guess. Yeah, it's the, the horrible realization, isn't it, that those conspiracy theories have their roots in a real tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the bottom line with this reading of the deck, this interpretation of the deck. Mm -hmm. It's horribly real. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and that's kind of like what I just think is so provocative about it. And you write about how they had this worldview that each person or soul coordinates with a star in the sky and the deck contains references to a star, Kaput Angle, I guess is how it's pronounced. Something I've... A star, yeah, that's a yeah. star I've never really here talked about. What do we know about this star's attributed characteristics? What do the references to this star mean to you? It's the most malefic star in the sky. Bar none. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to do the heaviest kind of sorcery imaginable, this is definitely one of the ingredients, the energies of this particular star. That's why it's there. That's why it's kind of highlighted in the deck. Mm. It's part of a brew, <laughs> a dark brew. <laughs> well said. And, and because it's a fixed star, whatever malefic intention you have, its energy will tend to fix it in place and prolong its activity. Hmm. And that's why the, fi the fixed stars are important for that. And a malefic fixed star kind of has the double action of adding to the dark brew whilst maintaining its pervasiveness, its, its influence, its effect on people. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to, perhaps it's just worthwhile contextualizing what we set up to now, Greg, because recent ethnographic work has identified an opened out a phenomenon called dark shamanism. And for years now, people, especially in the West, have been looking towards shamanism as this liberating force, you know, as this ecologically conscious and all, and all these good things. And we've kind of neglected the fact that there is a complementary shamanism, which is correctly characterized as dark shamanism. And for those who want to follow this up, there's an excellent collection of academic essays called In Darkness and Secrecy by Whitehead and Wright. And it very much concentrates on dark shamanism within the Amazon area. But the core of this is assault sorcery and a kind of cosmological construct we can perhaps best describe as a cosmology of predation. Mm. And at the core of this is that the shaman opens themselves to possession by the most powerful predatory entity that they can summon. And in that form, they either can go out of body to wreak havoc or they can command lesser entities to do their bidding. Okay. So this is a core ethnographic construct. Now, 
the strange thing is that when we look at the card, specifically one card called Ipeo, it shows a monk with dragon wings. Okay, and within the sequence of ritual cards within the deck, you see a series that are intended to induce possession by a draconian entity. Jeez. And that card, Ipeo, actually depicts the monk totally possessed by the entity. So when there's different grades of possession, of course, you know, you can have a whole variety, but complete possession means the total displacement of the persona. The person will have no memory whatsoever post of what they've done, of what happened. The possession is complete. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in the context of dark shamanism, we're seeing a ethnographically attested process whereby dark shaman open themselves to possession by these predatory entities and then use that power, so to speak, to wreak havoc of whatever kind they intend to do. Mm. So that construct perfectly fits the imagery that we're dealing with and the kind of uses that this Renaissance elite would have. Yes, it's just, it's quite amazing. And you know, there's a lot of people, even today, we hear little nuggets of wisdom dropped by those who have kind of touched the fringes of elite circles or worked in certain industries like banking or politics at high levels. And they come out and say, you know, these people are possessed. And you're like, you know, you don't think of that literally, but that's a, a term that is thrown around quite often when describing the way these people act and the way it is to the way it feels to be around them. Exactly. And this is it. Now, if we can only start connecting our, you know, ethnographic and historical information to the current situation, we can begin to illuminate some of these things for the first time. They start to make sense when you contextualize them. But you've got to get the right background in place in order to do that. Absolutely. And, you know, another element of that background is you say that the Dieste worldview entirely explains the magically oriented motivations of the deck's design and use. And Dieste is a name that comes up a lot in your book. I don't hear it all that often outside of your book, but tell us about that family and uh, their connection to this deck. Hmm. Yeah, they kind of emerge out of obscurity in the, you know, 10th century or so. And there's various branches of this family. And, and you're right, they're obscure. I certainly didn't have any particular awareness of them when I started this project. But they, in Italy, they came to be the rulers of, of the city-state of Ferrara and were closely allied with Venice. And it's within that context that the deck was designed and created. Now, turns out that the Italian branch is a cadet branch of the larger family in the Austro-Hungarian area, the, the Guelph Este. And the other cadet branch of this family are the Hanoverian monarchs. So let me put this in a historical context. I think something like 17th century Mary de Este of Modena married the Duke of York. And when he ascended to the throne of England, she became Queen of England. Okay, and it was a short-lived monarchy. But then there was an interregnum, and then the Hanoverian monarchs took over. And this is George I, second, third, all of these people. Now, we're talking about an arc of history, which leads from a supremacy in the Renaissance for about 300 years, and then kind of switches saddles, okay? <laughs> just in time to catch the rise of the British Empire. Mm. And at the end of that, the tail end of that, catches the start of the USA. Right. And so the implication there is that there's uh, maybe a network working within groups that doesn't have the same allegiances as we might think. And, you know, when one empire declines and another rises, some of these figures or what we might call the Brotherhood of Saturn, they seem to emerge in these new empires as well as the collapsing ones. Yeah, so you have to put all the points of view together. You have to pile them all together to 
make sense of these kind of patterns because they historically they're so long lived. And this takes us right back to Byzantium again, where this pagan philosopher who introduced these ideas to Italy had a pagan school which taught purgy, which taught ritual magic and was completely a pagan entity. Okay. So what I'm saying is there's a tradition of a ritual praxis that was invented God knows when, it was alive and well in 15th century Byzantium and is now captured within these cards and carried forward. And again, how come we have these cards? Where have they been for 300 years? Is a mystery. Yes. But they surface now. We kind of open them out now. And this is the story they're telling us. <laughs> it is amazing. And that is one of my questions for you is, what other insights can we get from kind of tracing that chain of custody? I mean, I know we know the early steps and we obviously know where it ended up in Milan, but are there other nodes or bullet points on that chain of custody that you find kind of curious or interesting? I'm really at a loss to fill in the gaps. It's completely conjectural. Mm. And there's like 300 years where the deck is just invisible. I mean, it just disappears. Based on certain marks, I mean, the deck was engraved, right? And then they printed the sheets. And then one set of sheets were painted and delivered to a person called Marin Sonudo, a Venetian patrician. And the curious thing about the marks that were placed on the deck is that it identifies him. It identifies the fact that he was gay. And it identifies the fact that almost certainly the Ferraris were able to manipulate him, suborn him into betraying Venice. Hmm. So that the deck is like a payoff in a very important operation that Ferrara ran against Venice. And it's also a reminder to him that at any time, if he opens his mouth or stops cooperating, they've got enough on him to see him burn at the stake. Hmm. So there's that level of historical interpretation. Now, again, Marin Sanudo, who was he? Who were he? Well, his mother's family, the Venia family, and the Veniers claim to be descendants of the Emperor Valerian. Okay, and then you check out the Emperor Valerian, and it turns out he is one of the child-sacrificing emperors <laughs> of late Rome. Nice. He was notorious for it, yeah. <laughs> And that brings you back again to the card in the deck showing the child over the fire. Well, what the heck is going on here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a disturbing aspect to this in, in respect of the fact that all of the court cards, the named court cards, nine of them, all have one thing in common. They depict figures related to the conception of Alexander the Great not to anything Alexander the Great actually did, mm -hmm. you know, which is what most people are interested in, but to his conception. And when you look into the Alexander romance literature, there's one characteristic about his conception that stands out. His mother's intercourse with Baal Hamon. Mm. So that Alexander is like a demigod, you know. And again, <laughs> this is one of the connections that, deeply woven into the texture of the deck's imagery and symbolism, you know, connects Saturn, Kronos, the draconian force, and the Carthaginian god Baal Hamon, who's known for one thing and one thing alone. This is the sacrifice of small children, Milk, it was called. And it's from that word, Milk, that we get the name Moloch in the Bible. Wow. So we have these blind spots in the chain of custody of the deck. Can you maybe tell us how it got out of private hands and into the public sphere, into a museum? Well, let me just kind of touch on whatever I do know, which is very little, <laughs> so it won't take long. Marin Sanudo died in Venice in the early 16th century, and all his effects were auctioned at that point. Now, there's a jump of like two or three hundred years to a Milanese family the Marquisa Serbelloni. And as far as I can tell, there's only one connection between the Serbellini and the Venice of the 16th century. 
It was one of the early members of Serbellini family, two brothers, in fact. One became Pope, the other became a notorious brigand, and then got promoted as a hitman for Francesco Sforza. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he was plying his trade <laughs> and obviously got into trouble and had to escape. And then he's documented in various parts of Europe, you know, no doubt further enhancing his skill set. And at some point in the course of that, he got special recognition from Venice for services rendered. <laughs> I, I don't want to speculate on what they may have been, but it kind of ennobled him. Wow. So that's the one connection. He would have been in Venice about the time that the deck came on the market. It was auctioned. And as I say, the next thing is the deck turns up in the hands of the Marquisa Serbaloni, dated about 1830. There's an antiquarian, Count Chicanara, who examined the cards at that point, saying they were in the hands of the Marquisa Serbaloni. And rolling forward from that point, a set of these cards were sent, photographic images of the cards were sent to the British Museum. That would be 1901. Nine, I think, and put on display there where Pamela Coleman Smith, the designer of the popular Waite Smith tarot deck, would have seen them. And it's aspects of their imagery, which you now find in pretty well every tarot deck in the world today. Mm. So kind of unconsciously propagated <laughs> the imagery of Solar Busker into pretty well everybody's <laughs> tarot deck. And that seems to be how magic works, right? I mean, these influences, the power in them, they seem to kind of spread out, kind of spiderweb out, even if it's not obvious on the surface. That's kind of an interesting aspect. I think, again, you know, from an esoteric point of view, we have to recognize that when we talk about these energies or powers that are the subject of esoteric work, not many people talk about agency in that context. You know, most of us think of energy as like the light switch. You switch it on, you switch it off. You know, it has rules. It obeys the rules. But in an esoteric sense, these energies have agency. They're pretty well like you or me in many respects. And that is the way in which the energies behind the deck would have been interpreted in the 15th century. Hmm. Okay. It's, it's not some background buzz of energy. Right. It's an agency work. Okay, so, and that makes all the difference. If you start conceptualizing those energies working through history in terms of agency, then you have to rethink a lot of stuff. (laughs) No doubt. (laughs) Man. So just to to follow up with the the lineage of the cards, Mm -hmm. what's the end bookend for the path these cards have taken? Okay, so... Around 1988 or so, a German or Austrian tarotist got permission to photograph the cards and he made a a reproduction deck. And then, what, 2009 or so, the Italian state stepped in, Italian Ministry of Culture stepped in and bought the entire deck, I believe, from the descendants of the Serbellini family, although that is never stated. I believe that that's, and they bought it for 800,000 euro, and it's now in the Brera Gallery in Milan. It's held there, Hmm. okay? And our imagery in the book, and as you know, the Scarlet imprint are about to start shipping a reproduction, perfect reproduction of this deck. The imagery has been provided by the Brera Gallery to us. Hmm. to make the book and the deck, okay? So that that takes you right up to date. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I love it, man. And it, just to find this evidence of a continuity of elite power and a consistency of occult beliefs among their ranks is mind-blowing. It's really like what a conspiracy enthusiast has been looking for for a long, long time. Yeah, I think you've got to get into the mindset, not just of the elite, but of what I call hardcore esotericism to get this stuff, you know? Yes. And on that subject, you know, you mentioned Platonism a little bit. Everybody knows Plato by name, but it's really interesting because you talk about his philosophy really does have kind of a linkage to empowering 
the elite or justifying the elite's power. And that threat isn't usually highlighted when you're discussing Plato and his philosophy, but that might be why he is such a household name and why he's kind of been held in such high regard is because as far as the elite are concerned, he provides a basis for why they are at the top and we're at the bottom. Yeah, I think the whole way in which Plato's work has been handled or, or treated and certainly by educational institutions has varied enormously. There's like, you know, before the church and after the church, you know. So in the ancient world, Plato's teachings were from a very early date. You know, he has all these dialogues. There must be, what, 30, 40 dialogues. Mm -hmm. People were coming up for ideal sequences in which to study these dialogues, okay? But they always started with the same dialogue, Alcibiades. Now, why is that? Alcibiades deals with one thing only, and that is uh, Alcibiades is a very rich kid who his parents have died. He doesn't actually have a clear sense of what's what. But he wants to make his mark on society. And because of his wealth, he's going to enter the political process in Athens. OK, mm -hmm. so that, that's the scenario that Alcibiades, the dialogue sets up for us. In his discourse or his dialogue with Socrates, Socrates is attempting to say to him, you're looking for self-aggrandizement. But what about service? OK, so. The whole theme of the Platonic dialogues, it, they, they touch on many things, you know, ethics, theory of knowledge, you name it. But ultimately, it's how can an elite govern a society justly? This is the core issue of Platonism. And in order to be able to justly run a society, you have to be entitled to do so. You have to be totally selfless, blah, blah, blah. OK, and part of that. Plato's recommendations is that the elite should sacrifice all wealth and power. They shouldn't hold any property, for instance, no money. They shouldn't inherit anything. They have to be solely dedicated to justice. And part of becoming just is to become enlightened in your person. Selfless and enlightened. This is the platonic ideal for the elite. Now, you can see how far away we are from Absolutely. <laughs> getting anywhere near that. But that was the inspiration there. And in order to project that kind of justice forward through the generations, Plato elaborated this system of metapsychosis and spiritual internal growth so that, you know, within the Platonic tradition, they had this phrase, the hoi, Pepotismenoi, the, the illumined ones. People would actually seek to become illumined in their inner nature and therefore capable of dealing justly mm. out of their very essence. And because they don't have these family ties, these wealth, this property, <laughs> they just do what's right. Okay. This was the Platonic ideal. Now, the esoteric aspects of that is that such an illumined elite would also have the highest connection with the deities and so on. So they would drive the process of subsequent metapsychosis, of rebirth, if you like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it would become a self-perpetuating mechanism. Now, somewhere along the line, Greg, <laughs> <laughs> this idea of dropping wealth, property, and family ties and not having them to influence your justice got lost i'd say so uh, <laughs> and i think it got lost very early in human history <laughs> mm -hmm. so we're living essentially with a dark platonism it was not intended i mean as far as plato's timaeus is concerned the demiurge is a a deity who is filled with light he's not a dark entity at all huh he looks towards the source you know of everything Plato called it the good. It's it's like an impersonal, refulgent source. And it's he's filled with the beauty of that and turns and then creates after the manner of that. Now, this is like 4th, 5th century BCE. And then by the time we get to the 1st and 2nd centuries BCE and the 1st and 2nd centuries CE, this demiurge has now flipped over. 
Mm. He's become a dark entity, ignorant entity that refuses to acknowledge the source of his own power and thinks that he is the ultimate in terms of creativity. Everything is beholden to him and everything is owed to him. And this darkening of the figure of the Demiurge is a historical fact, which I don't think anyone has given an explanation of. Yeah, it's very curious. It's absolutely central to the understanding of how things got flipped over. Because from this point on, you know, you have the Gnostic cosmologies all identify a dark Demiurge and the need to liberate yourself from him. And therefore, that gives rise to a dark Gnosticism, which is acknowledging the dark Demiurge and working with him. Okay. Right. But this is a historical phenomenon. It, it was certainly never like that in the original Platonic writing. I can say one thing, though, and maybe this will help to contextualize it, is that we can't just look at Plato or we cannot just look at Orphism. You know, there's a whole range of theogenies, like Hesiod's theogony, you know, the birth of all the different gods. And throughout the Mediterranean basin, you have a lot of different creation stories. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you get a very mixed bowl of starting points. And depending on the starting point you take, you end up in a different place. <laughs> now, for the Renaissance elite, they're key influencer, if I'm right, it was, it was George Gemistus, better known as Plato. Mm -hmm. And his conception was that he took a classical Greek or Hellenistic theogony. He says there's, you know, absolute three entities, you know, like a Zeus, a Poseidon, and, and, and he said Hecate. And beneath them, you have a set of celestial deities and a set of Chthonic deities. And the Chthonic deities are ruled by Saturn, and they run the planet. Okay? They run this planet. Mm -hmm. So his theogony, again, is, is a little different from what Plato had originally set out. But it does point us towards the primacy of Saturn in the worldview. Okay? And that's why I take Plato as like the stepping off point from ancient tradition into this what we call the modern world, pre-modern world of the Renaissance. And that's why Saturn features so highly within subsequent modern history, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is, it's so hard to get a real sense of why that polar opposite view would be taken on the Demiurge, or just to say the creator of the material world. Like It's also just hard to wrap your head around because this is an entity that Today, it's like we can't really see. We feel like we can't see it, or we feel like we can't really get a handle on something that's so outside of ourself. But they seemed to find some clues to kind of draw conclusions on or to build a personality profile back in the day. And then for it to go the complete polar opposite way is just so curious. It is strange. And again, you know, it's, it's like the answers are not going to be found in digging through these theogenies. We have to think about our own specific situation now and what priorities we have and what, what we have to work on. I think the issue is centrally a moral issue that we're faced with today. Mm -hmm. So whether you accept the existence of a demiurge or not, is kind of beside the point. Mm -hmm. The energies that people work on or with in practice are of a much lower order. So that what we're faced with is a far more localized issue. Mm -hmm. It's, in my perspective, I see it as an interdimensional penetration of this reality by other realities. Wow. And of a multitude, multiple orders of beings. OK, so in a sense, the issue is far more complicated, but it's it's far less theoretical. So coming from background of energy healing, you tend to get the extreme cases. I mean, it's like if you work in the accident and emergency ward Friday night, OK, <laughs> Saturday night, you're going to see extreme cases. 
And in a sense, energy healing also brings you, confronts you with pretty extreme cases. And from that, I draw the conclusion that we, we have, as I say, this interpenetration of multiple dimensions and the crossover on occasion of entities between these dimensions. Mm. And I think the anchoring is the fact that our, our the consciousness is, in my perspective, a field. You know, it's not a byproduct of your neural activity. Right. It's a field like a thing which has a, a family context. It has a community. It has a historical context. It's almost as though everything that's ever thought or done coexists at the same time. And that's the way we experience consciousness when we work with it in an energetic way. I'm thinking in terms of constellation therapy, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, you get complete strangers in the middle of the room. You put them in some positions to represent family members, even if the family members are dead, gone a hundred years ago, doesn't matter. Those people will start to manifest the thoughts, behavior, and feelings of the people they're representing, even though they know nothing about them. Wow. So, you know, I mean, I would recommend anyone to go along to half a dozen sessions of constellation therapy and just try it out. It's going to change your views of reality <laughs> faster than anything I know. Wow. So other cases where we have one-on-one -on -one healing, you know, we have people who deceased coming through to help in the healing process. Uh, other times I've dealt with very, very, very dangerous and difficult entities that seem to haunt people. Wow. In a very abusive relationship, you know. You remember this film, The Entity? <laughs> <laughs> some, yeah, there's some very dark stuff going on, and there's some very bright stuff as well. You know, the role of higher order beings is not sufficiently taken account of, in my experience, in this conspiracy world. Mm -hmm. People are very much focused on dark side, which is there. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> It's dangerous, it's dark, but it's not the whole story. Right. And the ability to cleanse and purify yourself and make a connection with higher order beings is always an option. Mm -hmm. It's an option for everyone. And it brings extraordinary confidence and strength. Yeah, that, I mean, that sounds so interesting. And, and it's something I'd like to experience more and experiment with more. And it just seems like when you trace the evolution of ideas and things that have been projected into the culture, it's like this most recent round of materialist science, of atheism. I mean, this is like a deception that gets the culture even further away from not only the things you're talking about that just seem to be part of reality structure, but even the elite belief systems that are hidden behind the curtain. It's just another layer of separation. And it seems to be like one of the biggest deceptions of our time that any intelligent person would be a material atheist, because that's the view that, you know, I kind of grew up with and adopted and then discarded after a crazy psychedelic trip that showed that wasn't true. But it just seems like a major deception to inject that type of worldview because it's further and further away from the stuff we're talking about. Yeah, as well, just as an aside to that, I think you have to be careful as well when you deal with a lot of conspiracy stuff. <laughs> it also tends to depress you. Sure. So it actually closes down your awareness and it, it, it takes something away from you. It steals something from you. Okay. So unless you're doing the compensatory work on the light side, Unless you're engaged in serious, meaningful work, you know, like you do something in the community, which is meaningful, unless you're taking a lot of care with what you eat and drink, mm. you're going to get caught. You know, the, the strong dark currents can carry most people along. Right. So you need to do a lot of recovery work on yourself and people around you. I guess I've been very fortunate, you know, I've had the opportunity to see some very light entities at work, and that has encouraged me to say these things, to be honest. Sure. Yeah, that's something we definitely don't hear about that often. Can you give us like a, an example or, or two of the light side of these entities? I'll tell you one very strange story because, you know, it baffled me as well. I was this was about 20 years ago. I was dragged along to see this guy, Tom Kenyon. I'd never heard of him. And he was apparently channeling these, these entities called the Hathors. And my eyes were just like rolled up, you know. 
<laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, okay, I went along with this gang, you know, we're sitting there in this like amphitheater and Tom's sitting on a chair down on the stage, you know, and he starts singing. Well, this guy has, uh, I know, 10 octaves to his voice. It is absolutely stunning, beautiful. And this was going on. All of a sudden, I saw arraigned in front of him six beautiful white columns of light. And they were like glittering, you know, and these were like five or six meters high. And, you know, I was just like, whoa. <laughs> it, was yeah. like, it was like an overlay on reality. That's a strange thing. Hmm. And then these figures, the, these columns just drifted out off the apron and up through the audience and disappeared, you know. And late on in, in this, I, it's not a performance, but whatever Tom Kenyon is doing with these entities, <laughs> he's, apparently he's getting advice and stuff. Somebody in the audience said, well, what did these Hathors look like? And, and Tom immediately said, oh, when they manifest, he says, you'll see them as tall white columns of light. And that's exactly what I saw over there. So hmm. why I was chosen to see these things, I don't know. I am a bit sensitive to energies, but there they were. There they were. Wow. And the advice they give, you know, I check Tom's stuff every now and again. It, it's all about ascension. It's all about, you know, cleansing, purifying the channels and so on. And You know, it's all good, clean stuff. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> But if these higher order beings are indeed there, and it looks like to me as though they are, then there's some restrictions on what they can do on this plane. Mm. And I would suggest that each person's moral or ethical behavior is the core or the limiting factor. Mm. I remember Martin Luther King said, you know, the trajectory, the arc of the universe is long, he says, but it bends towards justice. And that's what I see in the constellation therapy that we do, that the core disturbances in reality arise from some form of injustice. And when you expurgate that injustice, when you correct it, you harmonize the fields. Mm. So there's an ongoing task that energy healers are, are embarked upon on a personal, on a community level, we're trying to create that justice. We're trying to eradicate the cramps and the squeezes and everything <laughs> within the fields of consciousness arising from injustice. And it's injustice that seems to me the core characteristic of the elite. <laughs> Agreed. And such a noble goal that you're working with. So th this is the work. Greg, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you get on and you do the work and, and in doing that work, you rise above the fear and pessimism arising from the darkness. Well said. Yeah. You can only stare into the abyss so long without doing stuff That's, for the other side. Yeah. You're going to fall in if you look long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I just love this. I feel like I could do it all day, but I got to let you go sometime. And I just really enjoyed the book and the conversation. It's broken down quite well, but it still requires so much historical context. And a lot of the players were pretty new to me. So it is just a great book that unlocks so many new threads and peeks behind the curtain during that era of the Italian Renaissance. And I think there's just so much to see behind it. So great work. And, you know, before... I let you go. I did want to also ask you, because you are an energy worker and that's the expertise you have, it, did that come into play at all when you were studying the deck, when you put your hands on this thing? We're talking about the energy of it. I mean, did you experience that firsthand? Yeah, it, it, a number of times I, I had a huge energy coming through, Greg. I mean, I was like paralyzed for like four days. It was so intense. And none of the energy workers around me could help, could move it, you know. One of them tried, you know, and, and they almost fainted. They had to go out of the room. It was that intense. So I was aware that something was driving this. And the way the clues came to help me break this code, sometimes really strange, you know. Right. I mean, I, I'm not a great classic scholar or something, for God's sakes. I study philosophy, okay, at university, but I didn't study ancient philosophy. Man, well, you could have fooled me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I, I just felt like I was being led by the nose, you know? Sure. Stick your face here. Look at this. Read that. Read this. Put two and two together. Okay, let's move on. This, You know, I was, 
And, and this was the result. And don't ask me why this is manifested at this time. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like you mentioned before, we really started recording that the story seems to want to be told at this particular moment. Absolutely. It's, and it's, it's a big energy behind this. Fascinating. So also, as we're wrapping things up, can you remind, remind the people where to get the book, where to check out your website and any of the other work you're doing that people might want to follow up on? I'm sure they're very intrigued right now. The go-to people are Scarlet Imprint, who I worked with on this project, and they've done a superb job in designing the book and in their general curatorship of this whole process. It's been excellent. Mm -hmm. It's been a pleasure to work with them. So scarletimprint.com is the go-to place. The deck of cards, perfect reproduction for the first time in 500 years with the imagery coming from the Brera Gallery itself. It's just coming online. They'll start shipping in 10 days or so. Some of the work I've done on ritual, on various aspects of entities is in the uh, Paraanthropology Journal. It's a peer-reviewed journal. And I put it on my academia.edu page. So it's like free essays there. Some bits of the book, some of the essays that were formative, very formative in writing the book are also up there. So you can read those for free. I think you just need a, a registration. As for my personal website, it's a disaster. I'm, I'm going to have it rebuilt. <laughs> I hope it's not. You know how these things get out of date. So I'm not going to recommend that for anyone at this point. <laughs> cool, cool. Well, you are right. Scarlet Imprint, I mean, in an era of mass production, they have preserved an artisanship that you just don't see often anymore. It's a beautiful thing. It's great that, you know, you've written such amazing words and they were able to complement that with a great book. So <laughs> it's just awesome. Yeah, the man. Present presentation is beautiful, isn't it? It is. So all around, amazing stuff. You've definitely contributed to our scholarly understanding of the occult beliefs of the elite, and I salute you for it. Take care out there, man. Thank you very much, Greg. It's been a pleasure. You got it. Take care, man. You too. Sweet, sweet Stranger Things people, Peter Mark Adams and the Game of Saturn. What a great subject. And whenever someone asks me if it's possible that the elite might have come from a reptilian bloodline of some kind, or do I think the elite make deals with dark forces, I'm going to say don't take my word for it. Let's just see what the Italian Renaissance elite had to say for themselves. It's provocative. And granted, you can't see the art on the cards in an audio show, but you can always use the links in the show notes or just Google the deck. It is really one of my favorite types of episodes to do, where we kind of examine something that can move the needle in terms of making the case for some far-out positions. And really, what is more far-out than a deal with the Demiurge to bypass the reincarnation cycle and rule over man as the management class of this manifestation? Of course, I can't say exactly why the deck was made, but given the context of the times, it's clearly a very special piece, and I love that Peter really let me run with the speculation. We pushed it today. But, you know, that's what we do here. Peter, though, what a knowledgeable guy, great writer. I just loved it. To find this sort of physical evidence for a continuity to elite power and a consistency of occult beliefs among their ranks, it's mind-blowing. I also think this one pairs really nicely with Chris Knowles last week, two of my favorite shows lately for sure. If you don't sign up for Plus now, I guess you just maybe never will, because these are the shows that I'd be looking for. In the second half of today's, we got deeper into the deck in several ways. We focused in on the trump cards and why they point to Northern Africa. We broke down the mysteries of the suit cards, the deck's codes and multiple levels of encryption, the science of the homunculus, Demonic fellatio. Cannot forget demonic fellatio. Also, the details of the cards that reference human sacrifice, what that's all about, how Troy was once referenced to as the realm of the serpent born, also the court cards and the emphasis on half reptilian origins for certain elite bloodlines, how to tell if you were pledged to a dark entity in a previous life, the idea of the elite pledging large groups of people to demons in mass rituals, Dragons also, just to ice the cake, and the importance of positive polarity for good measure. 
Again, loved it. Can't thank Peter and Scarlet Imprint enough. Also, Gordon, for having him on Rune Soup and filling me in on just how fascinating this study was. In other news, THC is doing another live show with Tinfoil Hat. This time I'm supposed to be doing stand-up, so we'll see what I can come up with in a week's time with no prior experience and crippling anxiety, but it is what it is. So remember, remember the 8th of November at the La Jolla Comedy Store. And this time I don't have to drive three hours back and forth to L.A., which is a beautiful thing. We're going to leave that to Sam Tripoli, Ryan Davis, and Eddie Bravo, who will all be there. I got one more episode of The Higher Side to get out to you before the end of October, and it is more of just a fun one. The original plan was to run through a bunch of paranormal stories with a guy who's been an author in that world for decades. But as soon as we got going and he noted that he was 11 when Roswell happened and also had an out-of-body experience, I actually just thought it was really interesting for me in a paranormal archive sort of sense to just hear the anecdotes and musings of a guy in his 80s who's lived and watched the paranormal and conspiratorial wheelhouse for literally twice the length of my entire life. I also have a hell of a Halloween story to tell you on that episode myself, but I'm getting out of here. I'm still trying to convince the wife to be my handmaid for Halloween for anyone who's seen the show, because I could just wear a suit, which is nice and easy, but I don't think she's a huge fan of the implication. <laughs> I guess I understand, but I gotta keep making my case and learn how to write jokes. So, I'll see you soon. Your move, Saturnian Brotherhood, billionaire bloodlines, and demiurgic dealmakers... Your fucking move. No one knows what it's like to be the bad man, to be the sad man behind blue eyes. And no one knows what it's like to be hated, to be faded. Telling only lies But my dreams Aren't as empty As my conscience Seems to be I have hours Only lonely Since they exposed me on THC No one knows what it's like To feel these feelings Like I do And I blame you No one bites back his heart On their anger 